Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Walsh coming to you live from Port Byron, Illinois, for the Illinois Fire Service Institute, where today we're going to be talking about wildland firefighting. So we're going to let you get signed on here. Let us know where you're watching from. Obviously, we're outside today. We're actually going to be burning some field behind us here during the wildland segment to show you how to get control of that. So uh, let us know where you're watching from. Get signed on. And today's handout is already being posted in the comments section so you can follow along with us during the training right now live or on your training night back at the firehouse. So we'll see you in a minute. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Walsh coming to you live from Port Byron, Illinois, on the western edge of the state of Illinois, out near the Mississippi River, on the border of Iowa as well, where today we're going to be discussing wildland urban interface, basic considerations for firefighters all across the state. And if you've been watching the news like everybody else in the country, you know it's a big issue. So our wildland guys are not only great instructors, but they're practitioners. They've taught over a thousand firefighters in the state of Oregon the last three years. And all our wildland programs here in the state of Illinois are sponsored by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, where they provide free grant funding for firefighters all across the state to take this class. So if you're a fire chief and you're looking for some great new training for your firefighters with everything that's going on in the country, this is an area of expertise that you should investigate. We want to call out our partners, just like I did a few minutes ago. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources, which provides grant funding, steel fire equipment, Bullard Fire Products, uh, MSA, and many other people, including Nupla Tools, who's a brand new partner of the Illinois Fire Service Institute, who will be providing some uh, tools for us to work with uh, later this year. Uh, all their tools right now are committed out on the West Coast to actually fighting fires. So let's get our instructors uh, in introduced today. Let's get started, and we'll be burning this field behind us today after we get through our topical information. So we're actually going to get some hands-on demonstration for you today as well. So we have Steven Salos and Deke Carls from the Wild Lab Program. They're going to come in and introduce ourselves, and then we'll get started. Steve, come on in. My name's Steve Salos. I'm a captain with Fort Byron Fire Department, Rapid City Fire Protection District. Um, I'm also with Wild Lab, as Tim mentioned. Um, besides Wild Lab production, um, I am also working with Industrial Fire Program, uh, Fire College, Explorer College, um, the BOF, or Blended Online Fire. Uh, academies throughout the state, um, besides just specializing in wildlife. And next will be Deke Carls. Hi, I'm Deke Carls. I'm with the Hillsdale Fire Protection District, assistant chief with them. I've uh, been with the Illinois Fire Service Institute since 2012. Uh, I work with predominantly the wildland program, also work with Fire College, um, Explorer College, BOF, LP, and then I also helped write and develop the Large Animal Technical Rescue Program. So. A little bit about myself let's dive into some wildland talk today so our goal today is not to make you guys wildland firefighters all right we're just trying to give you a few topics to be considering if as an agency you get called out to this type of a, uh, a call have some safety factors some, some basic knowledge to kind of get you guys thinking about things if this piques your interest today definitely get a hold of us and, and consider doing our full courses and we can go into a lot more detail so in a short amount of time we can only uh, touch on certain aspects but at least get you guys introduced to it so first of all, you know, what is wildland firefighting? It can often go by different names. It may be ground cover fires, field fires, uh, you know, crop fires, wildland. Uh, it comes by a variety of names. Essentially, it's when we've got vegetative type fuels 
burning out in the open and we need to uh, control it. A lot of times these things can start to bump up into our what we call wildland urban interface where we're, the, the vegetative fuels that are burning get close to homes or businesses or other infrastructures such as railways, pipelines, and the sort. Those are all factors that we got to take into consideration as we're you know planning our uh, operations on these calls. All right. So there's a few different things that we need to think about with wildland firefighting. Just like any other fire uh, response, we've got the basic fire triangle. You've got your fuel source, you've got oxygen, and you've got a heat source. That still applies. How those three come together and to make that dynamic of fire is a little bit different in our environment compared to that structural setting. All right, so we just need to understand those variances and how that's going to play. Obviously, we've got an unlimited supply of oxygen. We're outdoors in the open, uh, but that also works to our advantage because that heat can dissipate out away from us and our conditions are a little bit different than we're working in. All right. So we also have a second triangle that we work under, and this is how we predict the wildland fire behavior. And with that, we call it the, uh, the, the weather, the fuels, and the topography. And how those three come together is how we can predict what we expect our fire to behave like, how we expect it to progress over the course of time, over the course of the property that's being burned. All right, and we can use that to our advantage to help us determine the best tactics, where we should initiate into our, our operations, when we need to pull back in the sort. One of the big advantages with wildland firefighting compared to structural firefighting is we get to pick our battle. If my conditions are bad where the fire is currently at when we uh, first get on scene, but I see that you know the fuel type is going to change and it's going to be in a better condition or the topography is going to be safer for us to traverse in another 100 yards, maybe I can pick my battle there and choose to make that fight at that point versus engaging in a more uh, higher risk scenario when we first arrive on scene. It's not like that in the structural setting. When the house is on fire, we got to fight that fire right where it sits. So that's one of the advantages that we have. Let's talk on those three legs of the triangle in a little bit more detail. So we'll start off with the fuels. The fuels we want to look at the type of, you know, what's actually burning. You know, that can vary drastically. It could be just some light grass like we've got a little bit right here behind me. This is what we're going to burn um, later at the end of this. Um, it's a light, flashy fuel. It's got nice, even continuity going all the way across. Um, it's going to burn faster uh, with lower heat intensity compared to a timber line like I've got farther off in the back. All right, something like that. It's going to take more heat and energy to get that fire going, but once it does go, it's going to have a lot of power with it. All right, and then we also got standing crop um, off in the distance. Okay, a fire in that is going to behave very differently, especially with standing corn. That fire is going to typically run across the top of that versus down at the ground. So we can have fires at varying levels throughout our fuels. We can even have it underground within root systems and things like that. All things that we need to take into consideration. These finer fuels are going to burn hotter. Uh, much flashier and move much faster. Their, the dryness is going to change much quicker throughout the course of the day versus a thick heavy fuel like timber or something like that. All considerations that we need to take into effect. All right. Now let's talk about our uh, weather. How are we going to, how's that going to impact us? Well, we look at a variety of factors with weather. With weather, we want to look at the temperatures. How hot is it out there? How cool is it? The hotter it gets, um, it's obviously going to start drying out our fuels a little bit more. Uh, it's also going to um, start impacting not only the fuels, but also our, our manpower that we have out on the operation. If it's getting a lot hotter over the course of that fire in that day, we need to take that into consideration know when we need to be rotating out our crews. All right. So the other thing with the, the temperature, as we're watching that, as the temperature goes up, my relative humidity is going down. Well, what does that mean? Uh, that, that's the moisture that's in the air, and how is that impacting my fuel? So a grassy plot like we have today, as that you know starts drying out the air, that moisture is coming out of the, uh, the fields as well, which means they're going to be easier to ignite. They're going to burn more rapidly. So those are some factors that we want to watch, and that can change uh, very drastically over the course of the day, especially in the Midwest. All right, Our weather fluctuates quite a bit. This morning it was quite a bit cooler, relative humidity was much higher. This afternoon it's getting a lot more favorable for burn conditions. All right, so that's one of those factors that we need to be watching. Okay, precipitation. You know, do we have any rain or have we had any rain or other forms of precipitation? That's obviously going to impact the fuel moistures that we've had. Um, one of the things that we look at real carefully is, you know, how much in the time frame that we've gotten. Short down uh, pour isn't going to impact my fuels versus a uh, light uh, rain over several days that's going to really saturate my fuels. Wind is a big one. All right, we really watch that wind. We want to know the direction it's coming from because that's going to play a big role in where our fire is going to travel. All right, the wind will push our fire um, across our fields and impact the direction. It's going to impact where we want to position ourselves. 
all right? The speed of the wind blowing is gonna impact how fast it's gonna move across. The other thing I wanna be watching for with wind is some areas where we can get kind of irregular wind patterns. A great example behind me, you can see the tree line that kind of juts out uh, behind me. If my fire gets to the other side of that, I'm gonna expect some kind of irregular fire behavior because as that wind traverses past that tree line sticking out, on the back side of it, I'm gonna get kind of an eddy effect where it kind of swirls back around, and that's gonna give me a little bit more abnormal fire behavior, which does increase my risks a little bit. We may expect some spotting, some fire whirls, or something of the sorts, and those are things that can increase the danger for us. So maybe we wanna pick a different spot to actually engage that fire versus right there on the back side of that tree line and, and take that irregular behavior. All right, how do we get some of this weather information? One of the great sources that we can use um, in route, uh, we can call our county dispatch and say, hey, you know what, I need a current weather status right now, today in this location of what we've got. And they can get that for you. Um, in today's uh, era of technology, everybody carries smartphones. All right, that's a great way that I can get some good day weather data right here, right now. Um, one of the devices that we use a lot is called a Kestrel. It's a small electronic device and it can give me wind speeds, it can give me temperatures, relative humidities, it can give me a lot of good information really quickly right here on the site that I'm currently at. Uh, traditionally, they have a weather belt uh, kit uh, for the wildland where you take a lot of these measurements individually so for a variety of smaller instruments. Um, but for the ease of use and speed, this is a really good option to consider. Um, so we can take all of that information and help us determine what may be the best course of action or tactic to use to overcome this fire and also to help us recognize the areas that's going to get a little bit more complex and maybe more difficult. Obviously with weather fronts coming in, that can change our behavior as well. All right, let's move on to the third leg, the topography. That means the, the lay of the land. How is that going to impact our, our fire? Today we're pretty simple. We've got a nice flat uh, area that we're burning. So we're not going to get a lot of impact off of our topography in today's particular burn scenario. Other cases, that the, the rolling hills like we've got off in the, the other direction here, those hills definitely can impact our fire behavior. As my fire gets to the bottom of one of these hills, it's going to pick up speed as it goes up the slope. That speed going up is going to definitely indicate um, you know, some change in directions. Um, and if I've got crews mid-slope, I've got to worry about the fact that they're going to be getting caught by that fire because fire can run uphill much faster than we can. So it's definitely a situation we need got to be taken care of. All right, just the general shape of it, uh, narrow canyons or box canyons, that can definitely cause a factor for us. We don't have too much of that right around here where we're at, but in other parts of the state and definitely in other areas of the country, we definitely see those kinds of features. And those definitely create some additional hazards, can get crews trapped in there. Um, and also is gonna create some very erratic wind behaviors through those channels because it's channeling that wind, so it's gonna speed up and kind of change their directions um, and whatnot. So those are definitely some factors that we can use to help us kind of predict what we think that fire is going to do um, over the course of our, our response. So we pull all of those pieces together and try to come up with that plan. All right. So that's kind of how we would assess that initial size up uh, for our fire. Now we're going to hand it back over to Steve and he's going to talk a little bit more about our containment suppression methods and how we can actually mitigate those responses. So we're going to switch a little more into the suppression and containment aspect of the tactics, a little more hands-on. When we start thinking about the, uh, we start thinking about the fire triangle we mentioned earlier. We have fire, the heat component, we have the fuel component, and the oxygen component. So we're going to explain some of the tools that we do and how we can attack the certain sides of the triangle to some help with some of our tactical decisions. Obviously, we'll start with the, the heat side of things. And anything with structural wildland, water is still the basis. It's very economical. It transfers heat very quickly. It's easiest for what we're used to using. In water, in operations in wildland, we deal with a lot less water in more remote areas than we do in a structural environment. So instead of carrying 1,000 to 1,500 gallons or having hydrants on every corner, we have to take what we wet use with us. So typically, we'll go to brush trucks. Um, smaller truck units, other than just your brush reel and your hose lines off your trucks, we deal with some backpack sprayers, uh, water bags, carry six gallons. These are fabric bags, they conform to your back a little easier carrying it. Um, it's pump operated, you will pump this in and out. You can have a nozzle with a straight stream spray or a combination spray. 
We're not using the water bags to suppress or put out the fire. We're using it to knock the flame links, the flame's intensity down, keep the flame out of your face, taking a little bit of the heat out, and then we'll use in our tools to go in and put it out. If you're trying to put it out just with a water bag, you're gonna go through six gallons rather quickly. But if you can spray it, knock it down, and use your tools, you can go six gallons a lot further. Switching a little bit over to the trucks, we use the same type of hose and wild as we do in structural. Our hoses are called single jacket. Structural hoses are double jacket, so they're thicker, stiffer, a lot heavier. Um, the other difference is we use smaller sizes of hose. Instead of using two and a half and inch and three quarters, we deal with inch and three quarter, one inch and three quarter quite a bit. With a single jacket being thinner and more flexible and lighter, we can actually carry 100 foot lengths, whereas structural hose is typically 50 foot lengths, and we can carry a lot more hose for a lot less weight. Um, we, like I said, we have the inch and three quarter, the one inch, and the very small three quarter inch size hose. We use a lot of the same fittings. We have the same combination inch and three quarter hose. We have a one inch nozzle, three quarter nozzle, goes on like a garden hose sprayer. And we have a forestry nozzle from the forestry service. This option gives us a straight stream and a combination spray. We use the same fittings in structural world, they're just smaller. Still inch and three quarter, but these go down to one inch and three quarter inch. We use the same Ys, but like I said earlier, it's all by size. We use a lot smaller size for the hoses. We use backpack sprayers predominantly for water usage, and then if we get a chance, we'll use an engine operation or a brush truck with like five, six hundred gallons. So knowing that we only have five, six hundred gallons and maybe two bags or six gallons each, you're gonna have to do an awful lot of work and contain that much water it last as long as you can. So there's the heat, removing the heat side of the triangle. The other part we can do is remove the fuel side. So we're going to switch over some hand tools and some firing devices that we can use to remove the fuel from our, our incident. In the Midwest, in the Plain States, we use a lot of brooms and swatters. If you're working in timber country, brooms are just very simple. You sweep the leaves out of the way and make your fire break. They don't work too well for suppression, but they can if you keep them wet. Most of it's for prep and line. We have swatters. You know, we really don't want to use them as a swatter because it displaces air. If that was burning material, we'd be sending sparks everywhere. We really want to be doing more of a mop and more, you know, patting it, mopping it out, smothering that fire. Use the other side when it gets a little hot. We're going to switch more into digging and scraping tools. For digging tools, we have the Pulaski and the Digging Matic. Some of the new tools, the rhinos and things like that, fall in with the, the old type of Digging Matic. With the Pulaski, it's just a regular axe with a Digging Matic on the backside. And if you come from an agricultural background, if you look at the Pulaski, it's kind of the plow or the chisel plow. You're breaking up the thatch, you're breaking up the sod, breaking up in the ground, loosening it up so the scraping tools can come in and start digging your actual line. As we use this, you don't really want to dig out in front of you because you're not really digging a hole. You really want to aim for right at the end of your feet. If you look at that angle, that blade is flat with the ground. You're just trying to shear off the top surface. You notice as I dig, I'm not really making that whole dirt sidewalk on myself. I'm leaving a lot. This is a team effort. These teams are 18 to 20 man. This team effort, I don't worry about the whole trail. I just take a little bit, let the next guy take a little bit, the next guy take a little bit. And by the time it gets to the back of the 18 to 20 guys, we have a regular dirt sidewalk. If I'm work, worrying about the whole construction, we don't make very many chains a day. We don't get very far. And I wear myself out while everybody else stays pretty fresh. If I take out my manageable chunks and let everybody else take their bit, we all stretch ourselves equally. Normally our work days are 14 to 16 hour days. You want to last for that full day. Switching into scraping tools, we have a rogue hoe combination where it has the rogue hoe. And this one happens to have the rake attachment on the back. Works just like a regular garden hoe. Short, choppy strokes. Like I said, if I was doing this in a line, I worry about a little bit, let the next guy. The teeth on the back, I can use it to rake my trash out of the way. It also has a pretty decent footprint for smothering and stamping out the fire. Next we have the McLeod, has a wide cutting edge, rake on the back for trash, 
It has an even wider foot for, for stamping out fires. Like I said earlier, short choppy strokes. Pretty good footprint for smothering flame. And definitely has a rake where it can trash and loose materials out of the way. With a sharp corners like that, if I have a root or a small stump, I can dig in and pop it out pretty easy. These are council rakes. These are the same teeth that a hay conditioner for cutting hay or a combine used for row crops. They come in a smooth tooth or a serrated tooth. If you're working in tall prairie plots with tall grasses, that tall grass can wrap around your legs, around your tools. It's always nice to stick a couple of these out front. Short choppy strokes, you can mow down the tall stuff, give you a little more room to work, let the tools start scraping. They all also come in handy towards the back of that line. We're just raking our trash out of the way. Short strokes again. You'll cut grass as well, roots. Also, they work really well in crop field crops. You know, we don't spend a whole lot of time in a pit cornfield. There's not much out there to save. But say your brush truck gets stuck, your equipment gets stuck, but your combine's buried out there in the field, and the fire's coming across. These tools are really good for taking a couple rows of time, raking out that field trash to down to bare dirt, letting the, burn, the fire burn up to you, separate, go around you, and it gives you a little more time to get your truck back on the road and get it unstuck. Last hand tool is a shovel. This is just a regular typical commercial style hardware store shovel. Forester shovels are a little more diagonal shape, triangle, and the head's a little more angled. We usually just take a regular commercial shovel, sharpen it all the way down the side. We usually sharpen down the side. The way we use it to dig a line, you bend over a little bit more, put your elbow into your hip, use the side of your shovel, and you can cut line with the side of the shovel. You keep it sharp, it'll take out ladder fuels, low branches and vines. We're dealing with a surface fire. That dead branch or weeds or vines that go up a tree is a ladder fuel that can carry it up into the canopy and now you have an aerial fire, crown fire into the trees. I can also take this shovel, loosen up a shovel full of loose soil. And if I'm dealing with a fire line with some higher flames, I can fill my shovel with dirt throw it down that fire line, knock the flames down, and then jump in with my shovel and stamp it out and, and smother it out with my backside of my shovel. So now we're going to switch over a little bit more to the firing devices we use. It can start off very basic. We use rogue fusees, or short, small or, or shorts or longs. Just take the end off, light it like a box of matches. Strike against the striker, light the fusees up. If you're doing a lot of lighting the interior operations with a fusee, we've created more of a lighting stick so you don't have to bend over as much to try to get it to light. You can light a lot of, a lot of fire with a fusee out in the grass. We can move to the next step. They have little LP attachments. These are just a regular canister with a, a handheld burner. Light the end of it go through and burn out quite a bit of options with just this little tank of fuel. You can go up to the 10 pound cylinder or the 20 pound barbecue cylinder. This is one I've rigged up on a MSA air pack to carry on your back so you don't have to carry it by hand all the time. And on the end of that we would rig up a normal commercial weed burner. Once you light the end go through and you can have a 10 pound cylinder of LP fuel or a 20 pound cylinder of LP fuel. Most of the workhorse of the burning that we do, we use with a drip torch. This is one that's set up in transportation mode, and this is uh, in use mode. You just unscrew the collar, reverse the interior stem, take the plug out, put it in a little holder, set it up vertical like this, screw the can lid on it. Inside the reservoir is a two gasoline mix. Uh, the diesel carries the heat from what we want to use to burn. The gasoline cuts it a little bit and makes it a little more flammable so it's easy to ignite. We don't put too much gasoline in it and it's a more explosive vapor so the diesel tones it down. On this we'll set this stem up with a handle here and a pigtail over here. The liquid fuel does not actually burn it's the vapor that burns. And it's kind of like the peat trap in your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink. It will stop. So in this case flammable vapor 
with his little pigtail, it keeps a liquid trap in it and keeps that vapor. Should that vapor ignite up into your stem, that liquid in this peach will keep that vapor from carrying on into your reservoir and igniting your reservoir. So you want to install it with the pigtail opposite the handle. Here we have a little vent cap. If you don't open the vent cap, it vacuums the canister, no fuel will come out. So you open this a little bit, it allows the air to flow into the reservoir, fuels the rolls out, comes out a little tip. You adjust it so that the flow hits right here on the end of the wick, flows through the wick. The wick doesn't actually burn and the liquid fuel that's in it vaporizes and burns off. When I go to light operation, I'll pull a little puddle on the ground, light that puddle with a lighter, it, watch it burn, make sure it's not too volatile. I'll dip the puddle on the ground, then light my wick, and then I can walk around either dotting or running a straight line or chevron pattern or whichever pattern is going to work with my fuel conditions that day or if it's too dry, too wet, I can adjust how it's going to work. And I can light burning off the field operations. I can use this for defensive, where I can burn out distance, or I can use it for prescribed fire. A lot of state parks, federal parks, they do prescribe burning to burn out excess fuels. It's a good part of fuel management and field management, forestry management. Reducing the amount of fuels that doesn't build up too more and we start having catastrophic fire because of the amount of fuel that are just built up over time. So that is a healthy part of management. We don't do a lot of line digging in the Midwest because of on small rural departments because of manpower and time. It's more for out west. But there are trips that we can use with these tools to make our lives better with what we do. Part of that is whether just hand tools and manpower that you, get, you wear yourself out, we can also do it with machinery. So here we have a 200 mile an hour backpack by steel. You can use it for suppression. You can use it in the timber to blow out your leaf trail and build your line. We, we've often used weed eaters. If you're trying to segment out a prairie plot with tall grasses, the big weed eaters with the handlebars and the saw blades, you can go in and blow trails and segment off sections to burn individually so you don't burn the entire 100 acres. You can burn it off in 20 acre pots. So we use weed eaters, tractors and bush hogs, stuff like that. In your normal burn season, in the fall and the spring, people are out burning leaves. That's where we get our grass fire calls. It's also handy if you're in an agricultural environment to notice the nearest guy with a tractor with a plow or disc hooked up. Just keep it in the back of your mind. Use them as an extra resource. You know that Farmer Jones has a tractor hooked up. Give him a call. Set it up ahead of time. He's willing to do it. Give him a call. He can bring his disc out and you can segment off that field and keep it from spreading. So real quick there, we've gone over how to remove the heat from the triangle, removing the fuel from the triangle. The other one is kind of a little more difficult to do is removing the oxygen from that triangle, triangle. But that's pretty much covered with smothering the fire. We use our tools to smother out that fire. We can use dirt to cover it, smother it out. And another one we do oftentimes is, whether, is use foam. Whether it's the high calf system or just regular foam, it goes in there and coats that fuel with a bit of a blanket and keeps the oxygen off that fuel. And that's how we remove that third side. So now we're going to switch over to PPE and risk management with Deke Carls. All right, so let's talk a little bit about safety. So the biggest thing that we want to go over is, you know, the ultimate goal when we're said and done is we want to make sure everybody goes home, right? Uh, so what, do we, what can we do to keep ourselves safe? And kind of the fundamentals of that is proper protective equipment. Um, and it, in the wildland setting, uh, typically we're going to use an all leather boot. Uh, we want to have a nice lug sole and good heel so that we can traverse the uneven terrain a little bit better, have a little better traction with that. Uh, so that's, you know, something real simple. There's a variety of styles out there. And then we're going to go into just a basic Nomex outer uh, layer for us on our body. Um, it could be, you know, the, the pants and just the, the Nomex type shirt. Um, the fire resistant jackets, uh, it could be an overcoat and pant, uh, jumpsuits, there's a variety of styles out there on the market. Um, for most uh, you know, structural departments, um, your gear that you currently have works just fine as well. The downside to that is a lot more weight that you're carrying around when you're out you know, hiking through these fields and whatnot. So one advantage that you can do with that, or uh, one possibility, is take that inner liner out. That'll lighten up the load. We really just need that outer Nomex shell that'll provide you the protection that you need. Your structural boots, they will work. Um, you, know, you don't have to be in uh, the traditionals uh, to be out fighting these fires. What you have as a structural firefighter will work. 
one warning I will say with that is your gloves. Um, you know, typically what we're going to use is uh, just a plain leather fork glove. Um, nothing fancy or elaborate about these. Um, and with the structural gloves, like Steve was talking about with the drip torch, if you get into those types of operations, you're going to inevitably get some of that fuel on your gloves. We don't want you then wearing those into the next structure fire that you're down uh, crawling through and potentially something catastrophic happens. So you know, maybe having a designated uh, pair of gloves just for your wildland, uh, that's pretty easy to do. Um, helmet wise, again, your structural helmets will work. Again, uh, a little bit heavier than what our typical wildland ones are. They kind of follow the, the model of uh, the construction style helmets, maybe cap style with a full brim like this. Uh, still has a head suspension in them. But they're nice and lightweight. And that's ultimately our goal is to keep our gear as lightweight as possible because we are covering so much ground and our uh, you know, operations can be potentially extended. When I have some type of iPro, um, whether that's just good quality safety glasses, goggles, something to protect our eyes from the floating ash and things of that nature. Um, in the bigger operations, you'll get issued a, uh, a fire shelter. This particular model here is a practice shelter. It's not a, a true device. But this one, uh, what these do, uh, they're a tin foil, essentially, envelope that you can get into uh, to protect yourself against radiant heat. It's a last ditch effort. It is not meant to, to be a, you know, an option to um, risky um, tactics or anything like that. They're really a last ditch effort if you're gonna, about to get burned over by the fire to try to protect yourself and save your life at the last minute. Um, sometimes we'll get into a few other things like using uh, some line packs. This is a uh, smaller style. We may use in an engine operation. We use this style a lot when we're just doing trainings. Um, or if you're going to be on an extended operation, we go into the full line packs. And what those will do for you is allow you to carry you know, some food, water, um, and extra supplies because you're essentially out on the line working for you know, 14 hours plus and you need to be self-sufficient while you're out there. So that just gives you the ability to carry more equipment while you're out and about. So like I said, we really want to keep that protective equipment in, in place. Make sure that we're safe. We're not going to get anybody hurt. A few other things that we want to just touch on is just that general safety mitigation. Okay, situational awareness. Be aware of the hazards that are around you. Slips, trips, and falls. We are on uneven terrain. Um, you know, there's all kinds of situations like that that we have to be aware of. You know, uh, dead tree branches hanging from trees that could fall and potentially hurt us. Uh, bees nests in the ground. There's a variety of scenarios that we could face when we're in this uncontrolled environment like the, and that Mother Nature provides us. So. Be aware of those. Some of the things we can mitigate before we uh, you know, actually get involved. If we see a dead tree that looks like it's just waiting to cause us some problems, maybe we cut it down, get it out of the way so we don't have to worry about it if the fire gets near it. So those are some situations that we'll want to watch out for. That constant situational awareness and hazard mitigation, that's real key. All right. And if you see something that's not right, make sure everybody else knows about it. We also have what's called kind of just a safety no-go uh, checklist um, called LCES. It's just a quick checklist that you want to go through to make sure you've got a few safety measures put into place before you actually engage on, on that fire. So lookouts. Um, lookouts essentially your safety person. All right, They're somebody that's in a position that can see the full operation. They can see where the crews are at. They can see the main fire, what it's doing. They can keep a better eye on the weather versus the crew that's actively engaged in that fire line. All right, You're focused on what that fire is doing right around you. You're not seeing the big picture anymore. The lookout's not the guy that's just got hired on. He has no experience. We want somebody that's got some good experience. They know how to read the weather. They know how to read the fuels and the fuels that we're going to be getting into. They know how to understand what the topography is going to do to us. They understand the operations that we're trying to do and how that's going to play out. And you know, maybe they're in a position because of a tree line or a hillside that we can't see everything. We put them in a spot where they can see it, and they're going to be our watchful eyes for us. All right. So then we also have to have good communication. So how's that lookout gonna to talk to us? How are we gonna talk back to command? How are we gonna to talk to our other crews? We've gotta have good communications. Falls back to just the basic radios, all right? That's the most common method used out there in the service in the fields. And uh, you know, but gotta make sure everybody knows, hey, what channel are we operating on? You know, Make sure everybody knows what we need to do, who we're talking to, when and where, so we can have good, safe communication. Lookouts and safety zones, or I'm sorry, escape routes and safety zones. All right, those are a couple safety aspects that we want to have identified and put in place before we start. So a safety zone is an area that I can go to with just my PPE. I shouldn't need a fire shelter or anything else to protect me. All right, how big of an area do I need? Well, general rule of thumb, one and a half times the height of the fuel or the flame lengths coming at me. And then I need to expand that depending on how many people I'm going to put in that safety zone or how much equipment I'm going to put into that safety zone. That's an area that we can get to that we're not really at any threat. 
all right? Um, the escape routes is how I'm gonna get there. We need to be smart about our escape routes, all right? Trying to go, hey, the escape route's going up the hill. Who's gonna win that race? The fire or us? Probably that fire. So that's probably not gonna be our best escape route. Or maybe they pick a path that's you know disrupted by uh, you know a field fence. How quickly can we traverse that? Maybe we need to do a little prep work, cut that fence open, open it up, make sure we got good access through it, flag it so it's clearly identified and everybody knows where it's at. So that's part of that community going back to the communication of just making sure everybody knows where those escape routes are, where our safety zones are at. And as we use those, we can keep our crews safe and make sure that we don't get anybody into trouble. All right, I'm gonna hand it back over to Steve and touch on a few more safety aspects before we start moving over to our field demonstration. Okay, the last thing we wanna talk about is what we call the 10s and 18s, okay? It's this 10 standing firefighter orders and the 18 watch out situations. We're not gonna go into in detail on video because of time, but they should be attached to the lesson plan. And also, if you, if you look into look into it online, just Google 10s and 18s, Wildland. On, in our pockets, we carry these IRPG guides. And on the back cover is all the 10s and 18s. There's different color codes for different eras. I'm in the late, latest one is purple. But on the back cover, we'll have all the 10s and 18s. And the 10s, if you think about 10s, is the 10 commandments, okay? These are the standard operating procedure. These are the policies, these are the rules. The watch out situations, the 18s, they kind of break down the 10s and make it a little easier to understand. Either way, the 10s and 18s together should be the red alarm, the red flag situation that we get into these and I'm reading through my list and I've got any of the things dealt with on these 10s and 18s list, it should be popping an alarm in my head that's saying, hey, something's not right. I really need to address this. Maybe I back out, reassess, figure out a new strategy and then recommit to the incident. So these are the watch out situations that are really gonna keep me safe. These have all been dealt with and created because of some tragedy we've had in the past. So it should be attached to your materials. If not, just Google 10s and 18s, wildland 10s and 18s, and you come up with them. Just read through that on those incidents and it's a checklist. Just how to keep yourself safe, how to keep your crew safe, how to keep your boat ready to go. So now that we've done that, we're gonna switch over and get ready to go for the demo and show you a little bit of field operations. So just want to talk a little bit, kind of reiterate how we're going to pull some of this together for you on this particular plot. So I want to first start off by just looking at the actual fuel type that we have. It's a nice continuous flow of nice, light, flashy fuel. It's very dry, um, got a little bit of height to it, not a lot of green material in there. So we should expect this to fire to carry across this pretty nicely uh, with nice even fire carriage. Okay, so then as we... Um, we're looking at the topography, very nice and flat, not expecting a lot of problems with topography playing a role for us. Using the Kestrel right now, looking at our uh, weather that we've got, um, our temperatures right now, at this particular moment, we're sitting at about 58 degrees, not too bad. Um, checking our wind speed, average has been about two and a half mile an hour, uh, with the max of about six, not too bad, that's manageable. All right, we're actually going to, in this particular burn, we're starting the fire um, for this demonstration purposes. So we are actually going to be able to um, kind of use the wind to our advantage. So we're actually going to start our fire um, so that the wind is actually going to push into our fire. It's going to create more of a backing fire. It's going to be a slow moving, just slowly creep across this field and let it get it going for us. All right, it's going to allow us to manage it and control a little bit better. Obviously, in a real incident, you don't get to necessarily choose those pieces. But being that we're doing this in a training scenario, we're going to keep it on the safer side and work to those advantages um, so we can keep control of this and not create any additional problems. So what we're going to do is get this fire going for us, uh, try to let some uh, fire get going, watch that behavior a little bit so you guys can see it doesn't behave the way that we expect it to behave, and then me and Steve are going to go in and do a suppression on it. And what you're going to see us use is the water combination of the water and the tools. All right, we've got all our PPE in place, our lookouts are staged off, off camera, uh, so we've got that safety um, watch for us. Our escape routes is going to be the mowed paths that we have, and then our safety zone is going to be the chisel plowed field that's out behind us. All right, so we have all those safety measures in place before we've actually initiated this. We already had discussed these items, all right? 
when we actually get in on the actual operation and we go into the suppression boat, what we're going to see is um, I'll use the water backpack pump to initially the, uh, the water. So we use water as our initial knockdown, just to kind of take down the tone just a little bit with the backpack pump. And then Steve will be able to use the hand tools in a lot easier manner to do that final extinguishment so we keep good control of this fire. All right, so we've got the fire started for us. So let's take a little look and see is it doing what we expected it to do. All right, the wind is pushing it. All right, it's creeping out across. It's going into our mode line just a little bit but nothing that's not within our control still. We can still manage this, keep control, but you can see how the wind does push this and create the direction of travel for our uh, fire. It's overriding the amount of fuel that we have available to us, and it's going in the direction of the wind more so than the fuel supply. Not a big deal. We still got the chisel plow to contain this and control this. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and step in here with Steve. We'll utilize the, the water and the tools together. I'll show you how this all works. And we'll touch back after that. Steve and Deke working together out on the fire line using the tools that they talked about earlier in the show. I saw that there was a couple of questions that came in. We'll get to those. We'll let the experts answer them. But you can see that Deke has only used a little bit of water. He's working in concert with Steve to make sure they can control that fire line. And uh, they had about you know 25 or 50 yards of product burning when they first started. They're taking their time. They're working from the upwind side. They're not putting themselves in any danger and they're taking their time. They're working efficiently. They'll be out here for a long time too. This is uh, Steve pointed out earlier. He's not using a lot of water. He's just knocking down the higher flames. So Steve can get in there with the hand tool and kind of rake it out, stamp it out, as you just see him do. Those of you that are watching and are concerned about the fire, spot fires you see burning, this is uh, Firefighter Swallow's property here. He's a captain actually. So all the fire lines have been cut to assure safety here. We have creeks to the left side of the picture as you're watching, and a creek on the back side of the picture as you're watching. So there's no issues here. This is a controlled burn, training burn, and this is how we teach firefighters across the state and across the country to control these fires. We obtain fields just like this, 
we get them set for a burn, and then we put the crews in and we actually let them work with hand tools, and we let them work with the equipment, which is what separates us from other training organizations. We're able to deliver live fire training for not only urban, but structural firefighting and wildland firefighting. firefighting gear for a long stand like this isn't going to be very beneficial. You're going to get overheated, you're going to get tired. That's why the Nomex gear or even Nomex jumpsuits, as long as they're appropriate according to the NFPA standard, are much more beneficial when you're working a long stand like this. You're going to be out here for a while. And this is a control burn, so we only have two guys here. But if this starts getting going in a cornfield or a big wide open space, you're going to need a lot of people and you're going to be here for a while. So we're going to have Deke and Steve kind of tie up the high points for today and let them talk about the must things that you should do if you get a fire like this back at home, the training that you need, the tools that you should use. But I think what they talked about earlier is very important. You have to train for this. You have to take the class. You have to be proficient in it. Uh, this is not something that I was ever trained on as a city firefighter. We probably should have been trained on it. And the training is free down at the Illinois Fire Service Institute if you're an Illinois firefighter. So there's no reason not to come down and take this training. So, Dee, do you want to come in and give us a heads up on what we're talking about today? So, as you can see, we worked very efficiently, coordinated effort. I was using the water, suppressed that down. He went behind and continued to suppress that. We moved along, working together. It's a coordination. If I got too far ahead of him, I'm wasting my water, my energy that I'm putting down. I got to be in sync with him, what he can keep up with, and vice versa. Okay, we've got to keep that coordinated working this together. And that's really what wildland firefighting is very much a team approach understanding the fuels that you're dealing with, understanding the weather, the impact the weather has on you, understanding your topography, knowing what tools you have available to you, what could you already have on your engine that could be helpful, you know, a few things that you could potentially add to it, make yourself just that much better prepared to come out to a response like this uh, if you were to have you know, an incident like this. City departments can get called out to them, you know, all the way out to the rural departments. It can happen to anybody. So getting that training, it's really important. What we touched on today, just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more to this. We definitely do recommend you guys, if this interests you, come into our whole class and get the full training. So, thank you guys. Hey, so thanks for joining us today. We would be remiss if we didn't say a hats off to our West Coast firefighters that have been fighting wildfires all across the country. They've been doing a great job. We're behind you every step of the way. We'll be back in two weeks.
November 14th with the Fire Ground Officer Crew and Fire Chief Officers Crew on the Champaign Training Grounds, where we'll be delivering the five components of Structural Fire Command, where Chief Officers should be on the Fire Ground and how Chief Officers should act on the Fire Ground while they're dressed with PPE on, managing their companies. So thanks for joining us today at the Illinois Fire Service Institute from Port Byron, Illinois. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care of each other and be safe out there.